Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of the Space Shuttle presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth Jeep Eagle and Dodge, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation. start of the deorbit ignition. Columbia now passing over Australia. Landing expected at the Kennedy Space Center at about 7.10 a.m. Central Time this morning. Weather in the area reported to be good. Approaches flown in the shuttle training aircraft by astronaut Hoot Gibson. Uh, reports uh, recently that the skies are clear. Seven miles plus visibility, light winds. No concern for crosswinds on this uh, first landing. Anything you find, if it's soft, you don't have to pick it up. Just hard rocks looking for uh, spots on the runway or anything that uh, you need to. Okay, stay out of the uh, 60 degree radius zone off of the nose, after the uh, nose and main landing gear for 45 minutes after a wheel stop. Also, kind of simple personnel, stay up from under the orbiter. Well, we're looking over the runway for anything uh, we can find that would uh, be a problem for the orbiter. Uh, lots of times we find twigs, rocks, whatever might be out here. Some of it's brought across by birds. We're in the middle of a game preserve. Columbia, Houston, check auto damp and item 27, please. Expected time is 0809. The shuttle is a difficult aircraft to fly. It doesn't have engines when it comes back to Earth. It has a uh, very, what we call, high wing loading. Um, it has the short, stubby wings, and uh, I guess you could say it is a, a low lift-to-drag ratio. Um, it sinks like a brick. And it was watched with considerable amusement by uh, members of the aeronautical fraternity who called it the flying brickyard because it had the aerodynamic characteristics of a pair of pliers. Uh, and in fact, many people expected that if the shuttle were going to have an accident, it would be on landing because its flying characteristics were practically nil. It sort of lands in a controlled crash. The big surprise is the sonic booms. The thing announces its arrival with this boom, boom sound of, of, of the leading edge of the wing and the tail uh, breaking the sound barrier. People are self-motivated. They came here to be in this business, to do this job, to feel like they're an important part of it. And that alone motivates them to the point where the, 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 the thing you're more likely to do is get trampled in the rush to get things done. You don't have to lure people out to do work, not in our business. The thing is full of all kinds of toxic stuff uh, from its on-orbit propellant system. So you see these trucks go out to so-called safe uh, the orbiter, and that's making sure that none of these fumes are loose or can affect the uh, ground crew or the astronauts as they debark. You've rolled to a stop, you've come to the conclusion of a successful mission, and there's a real feeling of euphoria, but at the same time, your big experience has ended, and you're back to the end of the line, 
in terms of getting ready to go for another one. So there's a, it's a bittersweet experience. From this vantage point, we do a detailed look at the main engines to make sure they operated correctly during launch. All those black tiles on the base heat shield have to be checked. We have a little bit of tile damage on the lower surface, which may be the result of either ice or some kind of debris dropping off of the external tank or the solid rocket boosters. Right now, they're, they are removing the PSE experiments, which are the two experiments that house the, uh, the rats. About four hours after landing here, the astronauts are off the ship. The orbiter systems have all been saved. The tug's hooked up to the orbiter, and we're in the process of getting the final go to tow. invented after the Apollo program, and NASA proposed going to Mars. And of course, the price tag was phenomenal. So NASA invented at that time what it came to call the next logical step, which was to go to Mars, but do it by incremental steps. To get to Mars, you really had to launch the mission from a space station. To get to the space station, you had to have a vehicle that could fly routinely into low Earth orbit and back again. So how about building a shuttle, and you weren't throwing away your launch vehicle every time you used it. It is the most marvelous machine ever built, but there's no destination for the shuttle. The shuttle was designed to go to a space station, so it goes up and down to space without doing the primary mission that it was intended for. And if we don't have a space station as the destination for a shuttle, one can't justify the enormous shuttle course that we have. The Kennedy Space Center uh, is an incredible place where the real hardware comes together, and it, it produces its own set of difficulties. Uh, JSC is more cerebral. I mean, it's it's a, a paper project and it's a mental project. We think what we're going to do with that vehicle once it's flying. Johnson Space Center is the place that astronauts live and work. It's the place where people prepare for the missions, where the astronauts are trained, uh, where the missions are simulated, and ultimately when the orbiter is uh, uh, in space, where the missions are controlled. At 1150, we think the engine will go down at four minutes. Fido standing by for performance. First row of consoles. People are going to be mostly worrying about the trajectory of the orbiter, where it's going, and if we're making the, the places in space we've got to get to. The second row of consoles is mostly going to be worrying about the systems on board the spacecraft. The third row is mostly going to be concerned with the command of the vehicle, sending the commands, the flight director, and overall decision, and the Capcom communicating with the crew. Back here, the people in the hot seat are going to be the boosters. They're going to be monitoring the main engines and the hydraulics officers on the other side of that. Go for two fans and have big one. Discovery, Houston, uh, you go for the two fans, and how do you hear me on this transition? Being a flight director, it's just hours and hours of boredom interspersed with moments of stark terror. I wish they hadn't done that. They took the bus down for us. Most of the time, everything goes very well. 
And, uh, but then there are those moments where suddenly, uh, uh, and very unexpectedly, you're in a situation where uh, your performance has ultimate consequences. Not a good sign. At 11.50, we think the engine will go down in four minutes. Looks like it'll run till six minutes, Captain. Discovery update on the engine, we think it'll run to six minutes. I like to listen to the tapes of the missions and of the teams because after you've done it for a while, it's like music. And when a good team is working with a good flight director, it is like beautiful music. Did you finish the My name is Eileen Collins, and I'm an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. I'm currently training to fly on STS-63, which is a space shuttle flight scheduled for February of 1995. We've never had a woman fly in the right seat of the space shuttle as a space shuttle pilot. Well, as a shuttle pilot, we need to keep up our proficiency in between uh, shuttle flights and before our first shuttle flight. Predominantly, we fly the T-38. We fly about, oh, 10 times a month. I'm keeping your hands on the stick and throttles. When I first decided I wanted to be an astronaut, it was such a far off, wild dream. I was, I was embarrassed to tell anybody that I wanted to do it. Um, of course, back then, as a youngster, uh, there were only men astronauts. After this pattern, we'll be requesting departure to the local area. I want three, Roger. Whenever we say we want some astronauts, we get hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of applicants. Uh, it's easy to go fishing in a, in a pool that's this deep, you know. We pick 20 or 25 every couple years, uh, our superb individuals. Maverick isn't exactly what you want, and you don't want a uh, computer nerd or something. You don't want somebody that's very, very good in just one subject and, and not uh, broad. So what we look for is somebody who is, of course, intelligent and willing to work hard and, in fact, subvert their own desires for somebody else's, because in many cases you carry somebody else's science up into orbit and do their work. Uh, somebody who, who can get along in a team situation and behave pretty well in an emergency. In airplanes, the convenient thing is, though, you can put an instructor pilot in with a pilot and you can go putzing around the countryside and learn how to do things. Uh, space flight is still so expensive, you can't do that. You can't send a rookie into orbit because of the time and the expense. So um, we try to recreate the environment on the ground. Now, when we do the simulator training, we have an astronaut crew in the actual simulator itself. We have a training crew, which is, which is down at the console, and they have a script that they have written ahead of time on a list of malfunctions that they're going to input into the simulator. And then we have flight controllers over in Mission Control, and they don't know what kind of malfunctions are coming. And the astronaut crew doesn't know what's coming. Okay, we're in flight control room one. We're about to start an integrated simulation. We're about to launch Discovery. Copy and Roger roll, Discovery. So what you do is you, you launch and you immediately start getting malfunctions. And what the pilot needs to do, and the commander and the mission specialist, is identify what is wrong. And that's that's difficult. Captain Leak's going in. Left engine helium leak. Holler when you're out of the Eileen, we see a leak on the left engine helium. Go for the procedure. In training, they pound on us incessantly. But after a while, you even get used to an environment where there are uh, uh, 20 or 30 malfunctions an hour coming at you, and you get used to it. Hit 
Discovery Houston, main engine limits inhibit stuck in the bucket. You cannot simulate that pressure, and the way we make up for it in training is to put in a large number of problems, which leads to the same kind of feelings of pressure that you get on a real flight day when maybe one thing is not working exactly right. So. We're on one IMU right now. See, it pulls out. Yeah. It's starting to clean up a little now. It's not looking too bad. Now they survived at this for let's let them land. Crews come back laughing. They say if you can survive the simulators, the space flight itself is a dream. <laughs> Trying to keep up with the vehicle that's going about Mach 25, and our brains are only about Mach 23, so we were scrambling. Oh, it's, it's better than a workout at the gym. <laughs> My name is Al Strainer. Um, I'm a site test conductor with the Space Shuttle Endeavor and second generation space worker. Our job is uh, getting her ready and uh, space flight worthy from the orbiter processing facility. owned a recreational vehicle and you were going to take it on a very long trip before you did that you would probably put it in a garage and you would ask the mechanics to check everything when you put the space shuttle the orbiter in the orbiter processing facility the OPF you do just that and uh, we look at it very close. We're less than six inches in a lot of places. We've got it spotted in here and it's less than eight hours from being in space. We're back here in the OPF. Uh, there are thousands upon thousands of individual tiles on the space shuttle. We inspect every one of those. The um, tires, the main gear, come off. The brakes are, they come off and are refurbished and, and uh, reinspected, reinstalled. Every landing when the bird comes in, we check for meteor strikes, scratches that may occur, the end of your hair, if you looked at it, that's the size that we look for on the window. And you have to locate every one. We inspect it, and then the technicians come in and clean it behind us so the astronauts can see for the next mission. One window, an inspection will take about two to three days. Polishing would take two shifts. You have to scrub on them eight hours. If there's a certain amount of damage within a, a specified area on the window, they have to pull it out or send it back to pointing. When you get into the payload bay area where we have the cargo, you're getting into a clean room environment. We have um, bunny suits, which are a, uh, an ensemble to stop hair or any type of uh, contamination from the humans from getting into the machine. Like a hair in zero G can affect an astronaut's breathing. Uh, inside the crew, crew module, the radios are checked, the uh, navigating radar is checked, the, all the communications panels. The uh, computers run through a series of checks. So all those systems get a check out. And execute. I think you have to realize that when the shuttle was built in the late 70s, uh, computer power uh, was not very readily available, so that now the shuttle is outshone by your PC that sits at your house. Uh, in fact, each of the five flight computers only has 256K of memory. You probably have more uh, compute power under the hood of your car. In order to sell the shuttle to Congress, NASA kept downsizing it to a more and more modest vehicle and a vehicle that could increasingly use existing technology. In the early 70s, the shuttle was designed to satisfy not just NASA's missions of civil space, but it was designed to handle all the military payloads and it was designed to handle all the commercial payloads. That's putting all the eggs in one basket. The shuttle they ended up with clearly was a camel. That is, it was a horse designed by a committee. 
and um, it served no one's purposes. It was a good design. There were some compromises, but do we want to continue to whip NASA for a decision that was made 20 years ago? I'm blessed. I get to uh, walk away from my desk and look at a spaceship. My uh, father worked out here, Gemini Apollo, and the start of the shuttle. It's always been very admirable to help put men in space. Space flight is a, is a unique environment. It uh, starts with uh, the lack of apparent gravity. When you're taking away your environment now, that, that my system was not designed to be in. If you had all the money in the world, you cannot simulate zero gravity. <laughs> so, and that oftentimes presents the biggest challenges when you get up there is dealing with that and operating in that environment. Up there, you're on a different time. The sun goes up and down every hour and a half. And depending upon uh, your kind of work and sleep schedule, you have a different form of time up there. Right now, what we can identify is that there are risks, both for things such as bone loss, muscle loss, equilibrium changes, blood pressure changes, heart muscle changes. Um, we're trying to see um, what those risks are. I'm ready to go to work. The cardiovascular system, uh, it doesn't have to move blood uphill, it doesn't have to move blood out of my feet to get up to my heart. And bones, after a long period of time, they, they become more porous and they start to go away. The loss of calcium from the bones, um, it begins immediately, but it continues, probably at the rate of about 1% of your long bone calcium per month. In the middle ground, uh, things that uh, occur over uh, a week or two weeks, and that is the loss of muscle, because I don't need to use muscle to move around. I walk with my hands instead of with my feet up there. Everything takes longer to do when you first get up there, whether it be going to the bath bathroom or preparing and eating your meal or ex getting ready to exercise on a, on a bicycle that we carry up there or, or anything. If I'm sitting here in this room and I were to drop a pencil, I would begin looking on the floor and the tops of the tables and the tops of the chairs in the room, but in zero gravity, the pencil could be floating right here behind my head, and I could spend, you know, minutes looking for it until some other crewmate says, well, turn and look, it's right there. Sleeping up there is really pleasant. They advertise water beds as being so good because there are no pressure points. Well, in zero gravity, there are absolutely no pressure points. <laughs> and it's, uh, you can just close your eyes and drift off uh, very, very easily. Okay, well, Jack, fairly sharp on north of it. It's where uh, everything's just up. You guys on the ground? Going home? Pilots have to be able to land the space shuttle despite changes in their vestibular system. They may be confused about up and down and, and whether they're rotating or translating forward and backwards, so their inner ear may be uh, off. They can't fly as, as well by the seat of the pants because their seat feels different. And so there's a real adaptation when you get back down on the ground. You feel like you weigh about 300 pounds when you come back down and land, so you're gonna notice the guys moving a little bit sluggishly, a little bit heavily, particularly this flight where they're at the end of 14 days of being up there. We've had a few people that needed to be assisted. We've had a few people that needed to have some fluids administered. How close are we to an edge here? Uh, are we going to have problems? Personally, I was confident that I could egress myself. I, I wouldn't claim it would be pretty. In fact, it would may have been a stumble and fall and crawl and get back up and go again. But that's why we practice so much in the launch and entry seat. Well, my name is Robin Brack. Uh, I work in the crew escape uh, department and what we do in crew escape is we take care of 
all the life support equipment that the astronauts need to fly in space. What we look for in the equipment is to make sure that everything that's in the suit mechanically is functioning properly. So if they had a rapid decompression, let's say, the suit would do its job, uh, save the crewman's life, um, and they would be able to survive. If an astronaut was getting ready for launch, the first thing he would do was he'd put on his diaper. This diaper is just like a Pampers diaper that a little kid would wear, except it's made for big adults. The next thing what he would do is put on his Patagonia underwear. It's a liquid-cooled underwear. Lay on your back on the floor with your feet above your head for five and a half hours when you're on the launch pad out there, and I guarantee you, in short order, you'll wish you were wearing a diaper if you have no other means of uh, relieving yourself. We pull on a, a anti-G suit, and then over that comes the, the rest of the space suit, which is a, uh, a pressure suit, essentially. We call it the pumpkin suit, right? It's uh, orange, and uh, uh, international orange for rescue, so they can find you if you ever had to bail out. Coming up. Good. Okay. Okay. Green apple. You You're saving okay. somebody's life, and if something should happen, and it, it's very important. Inside the parachute, besides the parachutes, our life raft and survival water and radios and everything you'd need to survive in the ocean. Hopefully, long enough for them to find you. There are scenarios you can paint where the shuttle uh, comes down intact uh, but can't make a landing strip. And uh, you essentially were writing the crew off in that case previously. But now uh, we have the option to at least uh, bail out. Feels super. Thanks. You're Look. not going to fly, huh? No, not tonight. Coward. Americans want humans in space. It is part of our psyche. One of the problems with manned spaceflight is as soon as you put people on a spacecraft, you change the mission and the purpose of the spacecraft. Its primary mission then becomes getting them back alive. There is no scientific uh, finding from the space program obtained by humans, including the return of uh, samples from the moon, that could not be obtained uh, more cheaply and more safely by robotic spacecraft. So uh, yes, I can understand the symbolic value of uh, sending humans uh, up into space. But uh, it is certainly not essential for science. Good evening, and welcome to Mission Status Center. This is fantastic. <laughs> he is floating. The United States has spent two-thirds of its space budget on manned spaceflight, and yet all of the real payoff from spaceflight has come from the unmanned vehicles, from the scientific satellites and probes, from the weather satellites, the communication satellites, the Earth resources satellites. So again, instead of the astronauts allowing us to do things in space that are exciting and helpful, the astronauts are a burden on the program. Isn't that impressive? We 
cannot have a program just with robots. In the end, the American public lives through the experience of the astronauts. The unmanned people, the scientists, uh, have hated uh, the shuttle and hate the space station and hate everything having to do with them because they say it amounts essentially to clowning around in orbit, uh, to high wire axe trapeze um, and that sort of stuff, and that in fact it is antithetical to science. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Roger. Shuttle's scientific perspective is extremely narrow and uh, I don't think it's too much to say boring. I think you have to be a little careful when you listen to the scientists criticize the human spaceflight program because by and large those are the scientists that have grown up with robotic missions that don't require human presence. I mean there's another whole set of scientists, material scientists, life sciences, uh, biomedical science that are eager to get on with shuttle experiments. The human brain is the best adaptive computer that I know of. There are things that robots could do and there are things that humans could do. There is the extension of human experience. We are explorers. It's written into our genetic code. But it's not. You keep going to the same dull place in which there is nothing and call it exploration. You degrade the currency of the word exploration. Whereas if we were going somewhere to some new world, then I think public uh, support could much more readily be sustained. We are lost in an obscure backwater of space and time, uh, a small planet that goes around one of 400 billion other stars located on the periphery of a minor spiral arm of one of 100 billion other galaxies. Uh, that's the fact. That's where we are. And uh, if we find that uh, daunting, then it's time to work on our daunting machinery, not to ignore the universe. Hubble is an incredibly beautiful, it's an aesthetic kind of spaceship. I mean, it is magnificent. You understand you are a threat out there, your very presence. Rubbing and touching anything produce contamination by definition. You flake little things off, dust off. You try not to touch anything. We were trying to turn work into art. Just how good a craftsman can you be? Working out there is, is working with a really bulky glove. It's working with a suit that weighs 500 pounds, and you're dealing with screws two or three millimeters in size that were non-captive, because in zero G, everything is free, and you'll just watch these screws. They do their little dance. Every time you touch one of those things, you impart energy, and it starts a, a dance, dance of the spheres. I remember waking up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and turning on the television, seeing Story hanging out on the edge of the Hubble with Australia up under him. It's probably one of those one of the lifetime things. When I get to be an old guy, I can see myself with my grandkids on my knee telling them about, remember that big telescope up there? I helped train astronauts to fix that. Now, Hubble's the most powerful instrument in terms of looking at the universe that we have ever had. Now, that's why Hubble touches people, but not only as a literal, physical, scientific instrument, it is a symbol for humanity's quest. What is our place in the universe? What is our universe? If 
if anything, I think NASA has failed to communicate how really complicated it is to, to do space flight. It's certainly not American Airlines running on some timetable to New York. And as a matter of fact, it's an enormous challenge to get one of these things off the ground. I'm always amazed that it works at all. You know, and that's from being inside of it. So I forgot to pull the line back out. The line that didn't make it, so... Yeah. Pull the line back out. Dash one one. The shuttle main engines are high performance engines operated at 104% of their design uh, capabilities and so uh, we're having to look at the turbo pumps uh, and pieces of the engine after each mission and often replace them. The aft compartment of the shuttle is uh, kind of like a maze. I refer to it as a uh, space-rated Swiss Family Robinson's treehouse. The paradox is there, uh, unbelievable. Uh, you have a titanium uh, thrust structure that holds thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, pounds of thrust. Uh, right next to it, you have a phenomenal amount of plumbing and wiring, and it's all very um, sensitive and very delicate. Imagine being back here during an orbital liftoff. You've got gallons and thousands of gallons of liquid oxygen flowing through this feed line. It's coming from the external dis tank disconnect located down there. Everything that we do down here has to be perfect because when you go into orbit, there is no way of getting back there and working on anything. I thought, well, the shuttle will just be another easy system. Uh, you know, within a matter of weeks, after, a couple weeks after getting the books on it, I'll study it up and I'll be ready to go fly it. And uh, it turned out to be not the case. Aircraft is a highly modified Gulfstream II, flies almost exactly like the space shuttle. Uh, the performance has been modified so it descends like the space shuttle. The same descent rate, the same type of drag. It's very, very important training for shuttle pilots because the shuttle is a very difficult aircraft to fly, and it's very different from any other airplane that I've flown in my life. We have an instructor pilot in the right seat who gets the airplane up to about 35,000 feet. And at that point, we put the engines into reverse, and you're rapidly on your way down to Earth at the rate of 22,000 feet a minute. Airlines, you come in at about a 2% glide angle coming down. Shuttle comes in 22%. That's going downhill real fast. Before you fly as a commander, you typically have about 1,000 approaches, uh, and you get about 10 a flight, so about 100 flights in a shuttle training aircraft. It's a real nice process coming back. When you hit the Earth's atmosphere, you're doing Mach 25 or about 18,000 miles an hour. And, and the way you slow down is by pancaking or sort of speed breaking the orbiter into the Earth's atmosphere. And that's why the tile are so critical on the bottom, is that they absorb that heat. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 
Lower surface tiles can protect up to 2,500 degrees. It is sometimes hard to believe that it protects it like it does. It's strictly real thin aluminum underneath, that's all it is. It's a giant jigsaw puzzle that has 35,000 different shapes and sizes of tiles. The tiles were masterpieces of thermodynamic engineering, but they were also a nightmare for developing and building a new vehicle. There were 31,000 tiles on the first shuttle on the Columbia. They all had to be put on by hand. And it did seem like an endless job, like something we would never perfect. They were so fragile. It seemed like every time you were working on them, something went wrong. It took a total of 670,000 hours to put them on, 335 man years. A worker could install about two in a week. Uh, it was a nightmare. If one sees an infrared image of the shuttle, you see that there are extremely hot places on the forward edges of the wings and the tails and other places on the fuselage. Now we got quite a light show out here right now. It was really like flying inside of a neon tube. We were looking out uh, through there, and all of a sudden this glow started at about 300,000 feet. There's this nice, soft uh, orange light that uh, surrounds the, uh, the vehicle. Uh, it doesn't look all that hot, but it's there because it is hot. We're sure looking at uh, two to 3,000 degrees right outside the window. It was awesome and uh, very impressive, and uh, it worked. In the Apollo days, when the capsules came in, all the heat protection burned off. But what we do now keeps the astronauts safe. Without us, it doesn't come back. Then uh, she rolls out of the orbiter processing facility. Uh, we take it to the VAB, which is the vehicle assembly building, the big building. And then it's brought to this 48-story, immense modern cathedral that was designed for the Saturn V rocket, which was much bigger than the shuttle stack. And then it's uh, taken with a crane and, and uh, grabbed by the nose and, and hauled vertical and then moved over and mated with its external tank, its, uh, its expendable fuel tank and the solid rockets, which themselves have uh, been prepared for several months for this mating. Although it appears we go overboard in some cases and things do seem to be laborious, there's a lot of thought process put into that. You know, the, the old uh, carpenter saw, you, know, you measure twice and cut once. 
clearly the shuttle was sold on some false promises and most the most important of those false promises is that it would be routine and inexpensive not only were there no savings but the space shuttle has been fabulously more expensive than the expendable launch vehicles it replaced and uh, it was very clear to many people from the very beginning that this was going to be a uh, cost ineffective white elephant and in fact it has been i wish i wish there was an easy answer to how you ignite people's re-interest in the exciting and tremendous idea of man going into space when when you when you think back on the old days and, and one of the things that, that jfk was famous for having said and that is you take your very best hat and you wear it down the street, and when you come to a wall, you know you can't scale, you throw it over. And then you just try to go get it, try to get it back, because you know you can if it means enough to you, and it's the way you find out how much you really can do. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him to safety to the Earth. I guess you could, what you could say about this room, and as you look in here down to where the, met up with the Apollo spacecraft was the final step off to the moon. This is a pretty historic piece of hardware to be laying out here in the sand, but brings back a lot of memories that are looking there. And to see all these arms service the big Saturn, and what you see when you look at all this is you, you start to see, and I haven't been here, down here, been near this hardware in years, but you start to see the faces of the people and the, and the way it was back then. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, and I guess the 25th anniversary of uh, Apollo kind of puts it all in real perspective, you know, with the, how many years it's been and how far we've come, and, and this is what's left of that big program. It used to be so alive, I and mean, now it's near like the, the bones in a, in a graveyard. It was a massive undertaking, and, it's, and it took massive hardware, and it took massive people to do it. And they did a hell of a job, as history shows. It was a, an exciting show to see the arms coming back, and then the arms coming back, and then the hold down post-release, and, and it would start to climb out much, much slower than the shuttle today, and and uh, it just sort of held on to you for quite a while going up to, as it tried to clear the tower. It was, it was, it was gorgeous. Roger and Ed got killed in the fire. I guess I wasn't too surprised when that happened. I'm sure sorry to miss Gus, because he was a great fellow. And uh, so were Roger and Ed. I think if uh, Gus hadn't gotten killed, he might have been the first person to go to the moon, which had been good. A friend of mine was showing me a computer game the other day called Civilization, and in that computer game, you get to build the wonders of the world. And one of the wonders of the world was the lunar program. And I thought, gee, that's rather odd that it's in the same category as pyramids and, uh, and the great library of Alexandria and things like that. What an odd thing that this very high-tech thing is a wonder of the world. But in fact, you know, it, that is kind of how it's looked at, isn't it? That it was a one-time event, it was sustained for a while, and then it was no longer a continuing part of the human experience. Am I in contact with anyone? When I look back at Apollo and I look at those films and watch those 
look at those pictures and I think, was I really there? It's almost as if it was a dream. It's, it's hard to place yourself in that scene. It really is. And I look at it and I think, you know, that was absolutely the most wonderful thing that I've ever done in my life. And, and, and as young as I was, and here I am in another terrific adventure, and I'm the luckiest person in the world, without a question. actually carrying about three billion dollars worth of national assets you know here on our shoulders you know while we're going to the pad it's it's pretty mind-boggling but to me the more incredible part about the crawler is when you do dock it up at the pad the accuracy is down to a sixteenth of an inch that we can stop the crawler at uh, north south east and west uh, so even though she may be a clumsy beast she can really put it on a dime rolling about a mile an hour at this time. We have uh, about an hour and a half left to go to get to the top of the pad. And uh, Hans is running pretty good. I started calling him Hans and Franz after Beastie Boys, and that's where we got it from, was from a Saturday Night Live uh, uh, clip that used to have characters on it called Hans and Franz, and they were here to pump you up. And that's what we do. When we developed the shuttle, uh, we, we used the old facilities that, that had been created for Apollo and adapted them for shuttle. It's very much a cobbling together of budget-driven design compromises that we see. It was a learning process of old technology and new technology put together to try to define and place how we can go on from here to do it more efficiently. There are something like 30,000 people involved in getting a shuttle ready for launch and launching it. That's no way to make it cheap. The idea that we could have done that somehow for $10 million a throw just uh, boggles the mind when you see what actually happens. NASA was given a very difficult job and technically NASA performed, the shuttle is too expensive to operate. We've got to find much faster, cheaper ways of doing it. As the time for launch approaches, things get more critical. My mind is reviewing all the things that could be trouble spots. Did we cover everything adequately? Did we check everything? Did we watch everything? Are we really ready? The bottom line is we cannot afford another Challenger accident. OK, we've got a main engine flash in the plume of main engine number one. Do you notice any kind of contaminant in the exhaust plume that would cause that? I didn't see anything obvious, however, I wonder if it's related to that uh, event we saw just prior to this. And so if it means checking something another time, another 10 times, another 100 times to make sure it's going to operate properly and not jeopardize the crew or the vehicle, we will do that. The film analysis is like a detective story. We use different formats to piece together the event. 
for example, a small leak should it occur or a piece of hardware falling off the shuttle. A wide angle view gives us more time to plot a trajectory to watch the, the rotation and characteristics of that piece falling away from the vehicle. We have approximately 80 of these type cameras positioned around the launch pad. They are designed to look at the vehicle from every possible angle so that we can ascertain the condition of the vehicle during the hazardous fueling operation. After the fueling is complete, we come out here with a team called the ICE team. only got two hours to look at every square inch on this vehicle and, and pronounce it ready for launch. We are well aware that there's over two million pounds of solid rocket fuel in the boosters and over 500,000 gallons of cryogenic fuel in the external tank. So it is a hazardous operation. There is potential for major problems there should anything ever occur. So all the team members are volunteers. actually strikes me as a living, breathing entity. It, it makes sound. There is the hissing of purge gases escaping, the popping of valves opening and closing, the rumble of the burn stack as we burn off the excess hydrogen. And so you get this impression that it is ready to go and it's, it's catching its breath, waiting to jump off the pad. My name is Al Sofji. I'm the uh, shuttle test director at uh, Kennedy Space Center, and my prime function is to lead the launch team on, on during the launch countdown process, which starts three and a half days before the actual liftoff. The final hours of launch start approximately eight to ten hours before launch, and we come in, we check the weather, make sure we have good weather, we check with all of our systems and all of our our support areas around the world and make sure that, that no one has a problem that would prevent us from tanking or launching. When you get ready to launch the shuttle from uh, the Kennedy Space Center, you have several emergency landing fields on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, six time zones away. And so if it gets too late in Florida, that means it's already, particularly in the winter, dark uh, in Spain or on the coast of Africa. And so you can cancel a launch because your emergency landing uh, sites are in darkness. There is no actual button that someone pushes. We have uh, what we call a ground launch sequencer, which is uh, effectively a computer program that takes us down through the last minutes of launch. Um, it can stop itself if it detects a problem, or anyone in the firing room can request a hold if they see a problem. Well, I'm Bob Seek. I'm the launch director for the space shuttle. My responsibility is to make sure that, that we don't get launch fever. Uh, we don't get carried away in this pyramid of, of reaching the final go for launch. Everyone is polled where they have to indicate that they are really go to proceed. NASA test director, this is ICE team, channel 232. We're complete on the FSS 215 foot level. Everything looks fine. If I'm comfortable that there's nothing out there that's bugging anybody, then it's fairly easy to give the go ahead to launch. Believe it or not, I'm not a risk taker, and so I try to minimize risk, and I look upon launch as one of the riskier parts of, uh, of space flight. Maybe in the future you'll be able to uh, beam me up there, you know, beam me up there, Scotty, and uh, I would accept that. The count goes down. You hear T minus 31 seconds. The onboard computers kick on. Uh, 
you start to get a rush. The last few seconds, the launch count, there's a lot of dynamic things occurring on the shuttle. Things are powering up, uh, pumps, engines. You hear the engines kick on. You can see the large steam cloud rise. And then you hold your breath for a few seconds, praying that those solid rocket motors were going to go. And that six seconds seemed to last for an eternity because um, the vibration was so high, you could feel the shuttle just straining against the launch pad. You just, you think it's going to shake itself apart. And uh, let's hurry up and light solid rocket motors. Come on, come on, let's go. And then uh, bang at zero when the solids light. <laughs> kick on, you're going to go somewhere. Uh, the shuttle will not stay at the pad. What powers the thing is, is the absolute feeling and the love that the people have here at the center from the people that work with the wrench to the people that work with the paper, the people that really feel like they're almost physically pushing it off the pad, and their hearts go with it every time. And it's as if it's an absolute member of, of their family, if not a part of their, their being. It's very fast, and it's very violent, and it's very noisy. It's basically vibrations and noise. I'm scared of launches. I'm scared to death of launches. I really don't like doing them, but I accept them, and I accept that risk. Uh, space is my calling. The vibration was so tremendous inside the cockpit that those gauges kind of blurred. It was like, well, it's a good thing I've trained so long to study these gauges, I can't read them now. <laughs> In the space of about a minute and 45 seconds, we're traveling faster than the fastest rifle bullet. We're above Mach 3. What will we do if we lose an engine at this point? Will we return to Kennedy, or will we continue to Africa? Uh, will we go to Spain? Or, you know, will we have to dump fuel from our orbital maneuvering engines if we lose an engine at this point, or not dump fuel? And what orbit will we go to? And, you know, so there's all these things that you have to be staying ahead of the, of the vehicle on thinking if if the next malfunction occurs, what do I do? After two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, you're off the silence and you're onto, onto the main engines. That's a smooth ride. It is a bit of a relief to know that they're gone. <laughs> and uh, you figure that the main engines have been working just fine for two minutes, no reason they shouldn't for another six. <laughs> so you're feeling pretty good at that point. It takes approximately eight and a half minutes of powered flight from a liftoff at the pad until you're going 17,500 miles an hour. When you're on board, that's a very exciting ride. Goes by very quickly. When you're sitting in a management position, that is the longest eight and a half minutes in the world. I said, Ellen, Ellen, I can actually see the sky turning black. And Ellen said, great, and Don said, uh, what are the engines doing? And I came back in and I looked and I said, Down the engines are great. Ellen, I can st it's really black now because I was so excited. You know, MECO is uh, a NASA acronym for a main engine cutoff, MECO, main engine cutoff. So uh, you always hear MECO and there's great smiles that go up in MECO, particularly if it's a safe MECO. <laughs> Closing my eyes just as the engine shut down, I was, of course, in free fall. It's rather abrupt from having a, a 3G push in which you weigh three times. I weigh roughly 460 pounds or so, uh, to zero G into free fall. Just a magical experience. <laughs> it's, I, you know, it's euphoria on board. It's euphoric. There's just the whole crew who lets up a cheer. Um, 
Well, I, I'm not sure if, there, if it's an unspoken thought in everybody's mind or, or just sheer joy of being there, but it, it's certainly a little bit of both, you know? <laughs> we're alive and we're in orbit. <laughs> you know, I mean, what could be better? It's an archetypal dream of, of human flight. You know, we as humans, for as long as we've been humans, have thought about doing that. insurance salesman called me up. I surprised him. I said, yes, I am interested in life insurance, what he called. And uh, he said, oh, great. You know, I could tell you. It's probably the one in a hundred that he'd got that day. And I said, how old are you? You know, and do you smoke? No, no, good physical condition. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and great, great. And what's, uh, what's your occupation? I said, well, I'm an astronaut. Dead silence on the phone. Without a doubt, the hardest part is what I do, and what I enjoy doing. Is it worth the risk to my family? Because I love my family dearly, and uh, I have three small daughters, you know, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old now. And, and uh, when you kiss them goodbye um, seven days prior to your scheduled launch as you go into quarantine, because you're not allowed to see your children in quarantine, uh, that's a difficult night. Uh, very difficult. I asked Danny a couple of weeks before flight, are you excited about your daddy going up in space? And she said, no. And I said, well, why not? She says, it might blow up. So Challenger is uh, still there in the forefront, I think. That's what I think of every time it goes up. And the boost to separation really bothers me. And my children, you know, laugh at me. We have a joke afterwards, but um, I jump every time. Seeing that shuttle going up is like amazing too because you're watching all this um, power just push this tremendous um, shuttle into the air and it starts to hover at first and it seems like that's the only thing you care about in the world right now. It's an incredibly dangerous business. You're turning loose so much energy in such a short period of time. Uh, you're using such sophisticated techniques and procedures and equipment. Uh, we're going to lose people. We're going to lose more people. I think it's only through the dedication of all the fine folks who work in this business we haven't lost more already. Personally, on that day, I was sitting next to the, to the person who had the responsibility for launch director. And, and we saw the Challenger destruct in front of us. And... Uh, it's a moment that those on the team and those that saw it, of course, will never forget. I was the flow director for Columbia at that period. And we had just landed out in California. And on the way back, I had stopped off in Denver to see my brother. So I was flying back that morning. And I, I hung around my brother's apartment watching the count. And they had a problem with a hatch. And they were talking about the problems with, with ice. and time was running I finally jumped in a cab and had to get to the airport and I get to the airport and of course in an airport everything's in this. so I called my brother real quick and I said how's it going and he said you have a problem and I said what do you mean he said a big problem the the last time I saw Crystal McCall she was very nervous about the uh, doing teaching the lesson from space I mean she was going to be alive with hundreds of schools and she turned to me and said, I'm really nervous about all this video stuff. And uh, I was young and feeling very cocky that day. And I said, don't worry. We're going to take real good care of you. You don't have to worry about a thing. And I thought about that an awful lot. I was at my boss's office. We gravitate to some place where there's a television when it finally comes down to the last few minutes of the count. And uh, we were sitting there watching many secretaries and other people in the room at the same time and and when the spacecraft disappeared uh, in the explosion of course no one knew for sure what happened but they were saying uh, oh the SRBs have separated you know and 
And at that moment, you could see a couple of SRBs wandering off on their own. And my boss and I looked at each other, you know, and it was there was no word spoken. I mean, we just knew that uh, we were in deep trouble, that, uh, that that crew was gone. We don't normally keep the video on in the control room when we're flying because the video can deceive you. The truth is in the telemetry. But when all the data went away and we heard the reports from the site of an explosion, everybody turned their cameras on and almost turned on the video. And almost everybody um, that I've talked to said, uh, I kept looking in that cloud for an orbiter to fly out because we were thinking that we'd find a way to bring them back if an orbiter would fly out of the cloud. And of course, it didn't happen that day. I watched the ascent. I saw the fireball. Um, I screamed, please return to the launch site. I ran to the TV set, I turned the TV set on and um, waited with the rest of the country as they played that fireball over and over again. Uh, I knew those people, and I recall the last time at which I saw every one of them. When did I look in, in their eyes? When, what were the last words that were communicated between myself and each one of them? That kind of played through my head the last time uh, that I saw them, what the occasion was and what we spoke of, and I remember the expression on their faces. The films told us that the crew module came out more or less intact. We didn't get enough detail to determine what kind of intactness there was. For example, what, if the crew was still conscious or not conscious, able to make radio calls or not. That part we never really did determine. But we did not expect to see the crew module come out as one piece and be able to track it for some distance. I knew we were dealing with a very vulnerable vehicle, a butterfly, which is riding on a rocket. I knew about those things. I knew it was vulnerable. I knew it was fragile and I knew the risk was very high on this thing. But uh, I did not expect when the accident occurred that it would be due to negligence. It could have been prevented. It didn't have to happen. It wasn't one of those days where all the forces of nature ganged up against us. That the system, the people in the system, understood that we had a problem in the design of the O-rings, that a potential could occur for uh, lost the vehicle due to burn through of the casing. But somehow we, we were unable to work the system properly to get those answers up so that we could take effective action. And so it was a human failing. And uh, I'll never forget that moment. Every time I go through the Denver airport, I know. Then when you get to countdown, it never gets to be routine. <laughs> it never gets to be old hat. You can't help as a human being not to have that nagging feeling that, have you ever done enough? You know, have you ever really done enough? At this point, our forecasters are predicting only a 20% chance of violating our launch constraints at that particular time and uh, only a 20% chance of violating... Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Tallon. Have a good day. Thank you. You all have a good evening. Okay. Get uh, it up. Time, all right. We expect to have some scattered clouds. Everything else is on schedule. launch at 8.07 hours. The window extends to 13.09. Let's hope it goes on time. We've loaded the tank and we're, we're replenishing it, keeping up with what we call the heat leak because it's not a perfect thermos bottle. So we have to keep adding a couple hundred gallons a minute of hydrogen and oxygen to the tank. This is shuttle launch control of T-minus three hours and holding. Crew preparing to have the mission cape with the STS-59 mission in. We'll monitor. 
strange thing. You, you, you do all this sophisticated training, you have all these people who do all this high-tech preparation, but it really does come down to a few people who take you in a bus out to the launch pad. They do strap you into this vehicle, uh, and then you know that anybody in their right mind gets way the hell back away from this thing, at least three miles, and leaves you alone out there with all of this high explosives and uh, makes you think very hard about doing this job. Now on the way to launch pad 39. There is a ceremony, and I think it's a ceremony that, that, that we need as human beings. Uh, we need ceremony, and, and I think in this case, these are emissaries that we're sending out into space. Yeah, well, and the excitement in the bus kind of builds, too, as we're coming down. I can remember going out and, and people saying, OK, one more corner. Oh, you know, look at that. Isn't it marvelous? Normally, you're used to arriving at the pad and finding all these workers, you know, scurrying all over the place, readying the vehicle for flight or readying the pad. And suddenly, you get out there, and there's just the six of you on the crew and the six members of the team that are going to help strap you in and do the final hatch closing. And that's it. Those are the only human beings out there. And this. Uh, and this big, beautiful rocket ship. We're at the 195-foot level of the tower. Crew mods is right here. There's a, the external tank is not more than 20 feet to this side, and there's a solid rocket booster that's loaded and ready to go that's right next to it. So we're right in the middle of it. All of that's full, and we've got about a million gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen right there ready to go. So you're one of a dozen people that you're out here, and everybody else is four miles away. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus two hours, six minutes. Mission Specialist Tom Jones is now being prepared for first boarding endeavor. There you go. Okay, we got you now. At this point, you're kind of numb to the whole thing, I think. You're just uh, excited a bit and uh, looking forward to getting in and strapped in and settled down. And it's a bit uncomfortable like this. I'm kind of laying on some valves in the back of the suit. But uh, it's not too bad uh, for the first hour and a half or two. As you approach the, a little after that, you start getting a little uncomfortable with uh, sometimes back pain. So the quickest way to get comfortable is to launch, you know. <laughs> If you scrub, it's, it takes about 40 minutes to get back out here and open the hatch and take you back. But the launch, it's only eight and a half minutes to zero G. So <laughs> that's the most comfortable end of the deal. Beans have become such a trademark to what we do here at like Fish and Loaves. There couldn't have been enough to go around, and it grew and it grew, and, and now it's a tradition, and we feel like the beans are part of our, our luck, and the beans are also a part of the celebration. This is 
shuttle launch control. Astronaut Duke Kidman on the Clark Shuttle Training Aircraft. He can evaluate the actual uh, weather conditions around the runway. Definitely waiting you know, for his report before we commit to launch this morning. I think that uh, people become addicted. They go back time and again and again to watch them, you know. The, the people who live down there get up at all hours of the day or night when there's a bird about to go. You know, all the cars stop and watch it go. The uh, observance, it's, it's almost like people going to watch the king bathe. It's a, it is kind of a religion. I mean, it's like people are watching human beings leave the earth. And it's a process that they want to be a part of. It's kind of like our Super Bowl day. And uh, we're all hoping and praying and a little bit nervous. <laughs> you have a little bit more butterflies. You're looking people in the eye that's worked with you. Um, everybody's scanning what they did over the last 90 days. Yeah. Launch Director Bob Seek has just uh, had another conversation with the launch weather officer. Uh, there is still uh, a possibility that we will have a launch today. Not a 747 with wings out there tied to those rocket motors. And when everything's right, we'll launch. It's disappointing when you don't get one off the ground. You really want to get one off the ground. And uh, we're real happy when it's just the weather because that's out of our control. We know we did our job right. OK, let's go buy some ladders. If in the first couple of minutes something goes wrong where you can jettison the fuel tanks, jettison the uh, solid rockets, and try to fly back for an emergency landing at the Cape. And, and you, you certainly don't want uh, cloud cover over the landing strip under those conditions. Our forecast is still no-go due to crosswinds. Uh, OBS have seen peaks up to 20 knots on the crosswind. Uh, Bob, uh, I support their decision, and uh, we've, we've exceeded the crew on back time by a few minutes already, and uh, let's recycle for them all. And that's all happening at the LCC over here at the Launch Control Center. Nice try, everybody, and, and our recycle for tomorrow will be to hit a 7.05. Local time, beginning of the window, 1105 BMP. That's it, guys. That's the business. That's the business we're in. When it scrubs, I know it sounds selfish, but there's a lot of work to do for a scrub turnaround for 24 hours. What we'll do right now is we'll head back into the suit up room and uh, we'll de suit them, and uh, then the work begins. We've got about six more hours of work, and then it's. Uh, off to get some sleep and uh, turn and burn for tomorrow morning. See you next time. Copy. KSC area is clear for launch. Copy. And word that the blast danger area has been cleared of all personnel for the launch this morning. Still targeting 7.05 for our liftoff time. Clearing up nicely. Now, uh, checking the flight controls of Endeavour. Final check before liftoff of the uh, rudder and Alabon, so we'll be checking the main engines. Want to do it again? Yeah. Are you happy? Those okay, and remember, walk out this way. Go that way, huh? Hi, Ali KTV seer. Dagens video postcard for USA er faktisk lidt specielt i dag, for jeg står her ved Cape Kennedy. T minus five minutes. Yellow is go for open or APU start. TLT, OTC, perform APU start. Work in space. Good work. Kevin Chilton uh, now flipping three switches in the cockpit to start each of the three APUs. T minus one minute. Now turning off the joint heaters on the solid rocket boosters. Endeavour's computer is now controlling. Seven, six, main engine start. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the space shuttle Endeavour, observing the changes of planet Earth.
Dever speed now, 1,000 miles an hour, 5 miles down range. Dever, go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. Altitude 9 miles. Oh. Three engines now back at full throttle. Look at that shadow. Altitude now 15 miles. Speed 2,100 miles an hour, 15 miles east of the launch pad. Flight controller standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Good solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Like Dever now 33 miles northeast of the launch pad, altitude 30 miles, speed 2,700 miles an hour. Dever, performance nominal. Copy, performance nominal. It means to have to lose this one engine and then still make it to Africa. Speed now 13,600 miles an hour. 600 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. 5,000 miles an hour to go. Really for speed 16,400 miles an hour. Yeah, you came on 3,000 yeah, right yeah. there. <laughs> Present to Miko. The longest 18 minutes in the world that exists from T minus 9 until main engine shutoff. And it's almost hard to breathe during that period of time. Officer confirms the good cutoff as the main engine. Good job on the engine, buddy. Nice job, yeah. John, Mel. Yeah. Hey, nice yeah. job. Good yeah. job, buddy. We're up there. We, um, everything's uphill, we call it. You work for months, two or three months on an orbiter to get it ready, and when, when the engines light up and it fires off the pad, it's just like you feel it right in your gut. It's, it's absolutely perfect. It's beautiful. I mean, everything worked. No fits, funnies, fails, or falls. Hey, JB. Well, it's a tradition, at least. When you got something working for you, don't change it. <laughs> He's holding down on your beans here. Yeah. Manned access to space, we feel, is on our shoulders. Uh, it has to be damn near perfect every time because we can't tolerate a failure. We can't tolerate it. It's a zero tolerance program. And I think everybody in NASA realizes that, and no one wants to make the small incremental mistake that puts the space shuttle at risk, not only, again, for the human tragedy, but also for the enormous political consequences. So this is an agency that lives in fear of making a little mistake and that grinds the wheels to a halt. I think it is time for the American public to fish or cut bait. Um, either it wants to go to space uh, or it doesn't. And if it does decide to go to space and it wants to keep the people in space, then I think it's got to grow up. Uh, and it's got to decide uh, that you take your hits. You pay for this with blood and treasure. Should we crawl into a cave and assume the prenatal position and say, oh, God, I'm so worried about launching a shuttle? NASA cannot live in fear. I tell our people to take risks, do everything possible to make it as safe as possible. But we will not stop flying. We've got to go to the boundary. Now, if America decides if we have a problem to cancel a program because we've lost that ability to take risk, I cry for America, not for NASA.
the Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of the Space Shuttle presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth Jeep Eagle and Dodge, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation.